Okay, hi guys. Um, let me get this set up here and displayed. Okay, so today we are going to be like transitioning from World War One to the interwar period um, of our history between World War One and World War Two, and that's going to kind of transition us into the 1920s and the whole Roaring Twenties, things like that. So we're going to talk about some foreign policy, domestic stuff going on in our country as well too during this time. Uh, some great things going on, but also some uh, negative things going on within the country. So here we go. Post-war havoc. So one of the first topics that I want to cover with you guys is the first Red Scare. Um, after World War I, our economy really started to slow down, and this is because that we weren't fighting in a war anymore. You know, war, although um, bad in some circumstances, does create a lot of jobs for our economy because you're producing uh, goods for your soldiers and things like that. Uh, but then when a war is over, um, those, you don't need those jobs anymore. So our economy was then starting to slow down, um, and a lot of people had feared that we were trading a painful war for a troubling peace where our country then is struggling, things of that nature. Also in our country uh, during this time, we had an extreme sense of xenophobia, which is like the fear of foreigners. And we especially started to hate the German people within our country. And they started to receive a little bit of discrimination. Uh, and this is because this, it was be the Germans that we were fighting in World War I. Led to this movement known as 100% Americanism. And essentially it built up this massive hatred for anything anti-American. So foreigners, uh, different foods, things of that nature. Um, people were totally against it because it wasn't American. So in this image here, you can see this is a political cartoon. And um, as we continue to be talking about the Red Scare and um, other instances of discrimination because they are immigrants and things like that, um, it's leading up to this whole idea that foreigners are out to get to the United States. And you can see this anarchist here is like hiding behind the Statue of Liberty, waiting to stab it in the back. It has a bomb ready to go as well. So now let's kind of look at where do the roots of this Red Scare kind of come from and review our Russian Revolution for a minute. In 1917, um, hopefully you guys remember that the Red Army that was led by Vladimir Lenin uh, takes over Russia and ends up winning that Russian civil war eventually between the red and the white army and when Vladimir Lenin was in charge of the country you guys know that he pulled out of World War I and uh, focused more on the country but about five years after 1917 Russia becomes part of this whole new nation known as the Soviet Union so for here on out I try my best to refer to Russia as the Soviet Union and the Soviet Union would be like a block of countries over there um, eventually like parts of Poland and so forth, but um, the Soviet Union now is what we are going to refer to um, instead of Russia. So uh, obviously in the Soviet Union, they dreamed of a world under communism. Um, and communism, just a refresher once again, is uh, there are no economic classes. Essentially everyone is equal. Um, there's no private property. The government owns all the private property. The government controls the economy and everyone is equal um, according to the government. So everyone is the same and no one should be favored over anyone else um, is that idea of communism. So here's a picture in Red Square, uh, the Red Army marching in. Now, our reaction to all of this is that we are completely frightened. We are scared of communism. And the reasoning behind that is, is the whole, like the whole Soviet Union and communism is based on the fact that capitalism is horrible and capitalism is bad and that capitalism should be overthrown. Um, I mean, that's their whole mission is that they're completely 100% against capitalism. And that's what we use in the United States. Um, you know, we have our supply and demand, free markets and competition. And that's everything that the Soviet Union is against. And so people within our country saw this happen in a massive country like Russia and then start to fear for our own country that we would have these radicals that would rise up and overthrow the government. And so the anxiety of the country became fixated on communists or anyone else that had any sort of radical idea and, like, and criticized the government um, and their actions. And we referred to these people um, as the Reds. 
um, obviously, because you know red is the color that is associated with communism. Um, in case you didn't know, it's because it like represents the bloodshed of the worker working class. Um, but that is why we refer to them as the Reds. So there were some communist parties starting to develop within the United States. So then a lot of people then started to become a little bit fearful of everything that's going on. If you guys remember, the second wave of immigration was more from Southern and Eastern Europe. And that's over there where Russia is and the whole Soviet Union and all that as well, too. So um, more and more people from that area of the world were immigrating to our country, which what led to a lot of people being frightened um, about communism and also of course with any controversy or anything like that it's going to be blown out of proportion uh, by the newspapers and that's exactly what they did you know they kind of amped up that red scare and kind of fueled the fire um, it even got to the point where in our government there were like people voted out of our government because they were socialists and just on the fact that they were socialists and they were scared that they were trying to take over the government now Everything up until this point was more so just based on fear and like there wasn't any true hard evidence that anything was trying to happen or anyone was trying to take over the government. However, it did come to a point where there were several bombs that were sent out to different people within our country um, and then also bombs that were set off at people's homes, different important people um, in our system of government's homes um, that were went off all around this, the same day or the same night. And one of these homes was A. Mitchell Palmer's home, and he was the Attorney General for the United States. Uh, some other people they targeted were like, you know, those capitalists, uh, John D. Rockefeller and J.P. Morgan, but also they targeted people in the government. So A. Mitchell Palmer, who was our Attorney General of the country at that point in time, um, had been threatened by a bombing plot. And actually, there was a bomb that went off in his house. Um, didn't kill anyone, but obviously frightened him and his family very much so. And so when this happens, he then takes it upon himself as the attorney general to set in motion what we know as the Palmer raids. And these Palmer raids, they went and found anyone that were suspected of being a radical, and they would do everything in their power to get these people deported. They didn't even really have to have done anything it was more so like, well, could they do something? Were they possible of taking down our government um, and so forth? So they would work the system and get these people deported. And this, these are going to be known as the Palmer Raids, which is kind of like the big event in the first Red Scare. So here's A. Mitchell Palmer here, and you can see him talking to Woodrow Wilson um, over here. Um, but he was the attorney general who was targeted and then takes it upon himself in his department to start getting rid of these radicals and anarchists within our country. Here is a picture of his house. Um, you can see uh, damage done by the bomb. And then down here it says, these attacks will only increase the activities of our crime detecting forces. Um, but yeah, you can kind of see the house there. If we have time after this lecture, you guys are going to watch some video clips from this movie called J. Edgar. Um, now, J. Edgar is about J. Edgar Hoover, the man who kind of started the FBI and really brought in criminal science and evidence and things like that, because that was all kind of a mess. You know, they used to just throw everything away and they didn't use evidence and like investigations and stuff like that. But J. Edgar Hoover got his start under um, A. Mitchell Palmer. And J. Edgar Hoover actually had a part to play in the Palmer Raids. So in this movie, um, there's a scene that depicts the Palmer Raids and like them calling people out for being radicals uh, and so forth. So if you guys have time at the end of class today, you guys are going to watch this. If you haven't seen this movie, great movie. You can see Leonardo, Leonardo DiCaprio is the main actor here. And it's also directed by Clint, Clint Eastwood. So you might be thinking, well, how can you just deport a bunch of people from the country if they haven't actually done anything wrong? Well, to justify these Palmer raids, um, they used wartime laws that gave the government broad power. So, you know, in times of war, the government does have broader powers to keep the to use to keep the country safe. Um, You'll see that as we get into like World War II we talk, we, and we talk about Japanese internment and things like that. But they do have a little bit more power during times of war. And so they considered this, you know, the aftermath of war. And they were still able to use those powers to get people deported. Um, they called these people aliens. Yes, they actually used the term aliens. Um, and anyone considered an alien is a citizen of another country living in the United States. And these people could be deported. Hey, they had to be foreign born. 
And then also they had to be suspected of potentially harming the safety of the people in the United States. They didn't actually have to do something, but if they could show that they could suspect them of potentially harming the people of the United States and that they could be a potential threat and they were foreign born, essentially they'd question them enough to where it seemed like they looked guilty and then they would deport them. Like, cause they could ask them questions about being a radical um, and if they have ever had radical ideas to take down the government and they would just say, I refuse to answer, I refuse to answer, I refuse to answer. And when people don't answer those questions, um, they're like, whoa, man, you seem like a radical. You seem like a communist and you're trying to take down the country. So they would just have them deported. Um, so that, this was kind of the high point of the Red Scare where, um, they had over 300 people actually deported. Uh, they were successful, um, in that aspect, but over time, uh, things did start to die down and, um, you know, that new era of the Roaring Twenties starts to rise up and there's not as many things to worry about and people, you know, start to make more money and things like that. So the economy kind of switches. So the Red Scare dies down, but it's obviously not completely eliminated because we will have a second Red Scare, uh, after World War II. And that's the more famous one with McCarthyism and all of, the, all of that. So this is not the last time we'll talk about the Red Scare. So um, the question asks, who replaced the Germans as the object of American fear and hatred? Hopefully by now you guys know that the communists were the ones that replaced the Germans as the object of American fear and hatred. So uh, we're going to kind of transition into another aspect of this time right after the, after the war. I mean, everything wasn't fine and dandy. It takes a little bit of time for us to actually start to prosper again. And one of, this aspect, one of these aspects is labor difficulties. So, you know, people that were laborers and working in the factories and stuff like that, they had higher expectations um, of, like, how much they should be getting paid and things like that. And it ended up kind of creating a crisis because there's a sinking post-war demand. I mean, people don't need the stuff anymore. And Wilson was, really wasn't focused on the country and domestic issues at that point. He was focused on, you know, getting that 14 points passed in the League of Nations. And then everyone who went and fought in the war comes back and, you know, they had these jobs and it's like, well, I'm home. I expect to have my job back. So you have all these men that were gone and now have come back and there's, there's not enough jobs to give them because, uh, the sinking post-war demand was going in effect and we just didn't need as much. So those were all issues that contributed to like the labor difficulties coming back. And there was a few showdowns between labor and management uh, that had some like riots and things like that within our country or that led to some riots in our country. And this political cartoon just kind of shows it. It's like on top of everything that's going on, labor unions start striking and rioting. And it's like just causing even more problems for our country. So you can see Uncle Sam is just over it. He's sick of it. Um, and he is like swatting the labor unions. And you can see he's holding a coal strike, uh, coal strike, uh, fra flag there. So Going along with this whole fear of communists and radicals and xenophobia, uh, we have the right of nativism, um, you know, like native to America. And so those people like want everyone to be an American. And so there was a large backlash against immigrants. And so they pushed for more immigration res restrictions. And in 1921, we actually set quotas on the number of um, immigrants that could come into the United States. So we set a number and this many people could come in this year and this many people could come in the next year and so many people from this part of the world and so forth. So we started to set quotas. Also, we do get a revival of the KKK. Um, but however, the KKK, although African Americans were a target of the KKK, they now had new targets such as Jews, Catholics, and radicals. Um, and their slogan changes to native white Protestant uh, supremacy. So they kind of change their target. Um, not to say that the KKK wasn't still targeting African Americans, but they also added radicals to that list um, and Jewish people and Catholics as well, too. And this is the top picture here is showing them signing the Immigration Quota Act. And then these are just some uh, pie charts to show you the immigration. You can see Southeastern Europe is blue. And this is the time period we're talking about is 1901 and 1910 and 1911 and 1920. And so you can see most of the people coming over are from uh, Southern and Eastern Europe, 
which that's where Russia is and that's where all the communism was. So uh, people were fearful because of all these people coming into our country, which led to immigration quotas or restrictions, you know, only limiting a certain amount. Now, um, a famous incident during this time period is the Sacco and Vanzetti court case. And this just kind of is a big example of the xenophobia going on in our country, the fear of foreigners, the fear of radicals, things of that nature. And so a little bit of background on this. This happened in uh, Massachusetts, a very small town outside of Boston, Massachusetts, and it, and it wasn't really known for anything. Uh, but it's just a small town outside of Boston, Massachusetts, um, and there was a shoe store. And every day at a certain time, or once a week at a certain time, the person at the shoe store would bring all the money that they had made, and they would bring it over to this other location. Well, one day, when the guy that was bringing the money was escorted by a police officer, was bringing the money to a new location, they were shot and killed and the money was stolen from, uh, from them as well, too. And so there's people dead, and there's money stolen, and it was all from this shoe store. Well, um, they didn't really know who did it. Witnesses at the time said it looked like a bunch uh, or a couple of Italian guys that did it. And essentially, it's going to lead to the arrest of Niccolo Sacco and Bartolomeo Vanzetti, which are two Italian men, and one of them actually worked at the shoe shop. And what do you know, they're Italian immigrants, and also they are anarchists, uh, and vocal about being an anarchist. And hopefully you guys know that anarchists are radicals who sought the destruction of government, like they don't believe in the government. And so these guys are going, are, going, are going to go on trial. And you can guess this is more so going to be not even about the murder and um, the robbery. It's more so going to be the fact that they are immigrants and that they are radicals. And now they are on trial. And so it's more of a trial about their political beliefs um, and where they're from rather than the fact of murder and robbery. The evidence against the two men was pretty weak. Now, one of them, Sacco, his evidence was stronger. Like he carried um, a weapon. It's called a. It's called a Colt. I can't remember the second part of it, but like a little handgun, a Colt, um, and it matched the bullet that was found in the man. Like the type of bullet came from that type of gun, uh, from one of the victims. However, Vanzetti, the evidence was very, very, very weak. Um, like hardly anything at all. And they were put on trial for their political beliefs as well as murder. And these two men are going to be sentenced to die by electrocution. And they, it was appealed several times. And even when it was appealed, they said that there was outstanding evidence to show that Niccolo Sacco uh, was part of the murders. But they said the evidence wasn't as strong for Vanzetti. Um, but they're going to end up executing him anyway. And they were executed in 1927. So, I mean, the thing was drawn out for a while, but it was a huge controversial case at the time period. It caught the attention of the entire world. Like there was just thousands of letters that flooded um, the courthouse and things of that nature. Like people voicing their opinions like they're innocent. You're just trying them for their political beliefs. Uh, this is Bartolomeo uh, Vanzetti. So this is the one that in history, and we look back on it now, this guy was probably innocent. They think that he um, maybe knew about it and knew about the planning of it, but he had an alibi that he was at a fish market that day, and a lot of people say he was actually at the fish market. He wasn't actually involved in the murders. Now, they did believe Sacco was involved with the murders, but both of these men, because they were Italians and because they were anarchists, are going to be sent to death uh, by electrocution. So you can see like save Sacco and Vanzetti and, and this is Trafalgar Square. So that's in Great Britain. They're protesting these things. I mean it was all over the world. People were protesting this uh, court case. And here's a quote by Bartolomeo Vanzetti and it just kind of shows how he feels about the whole situation and he knows what the real deal is going on here. It says my conviction is that I have suffered for things I am guilty of. I am suffering because I am a radical and indeed, I am a radical. I have suffered because I was an Italian, and indeed, I am Italian. So the question asked, how did the United States respond to the growing concern about immigration? Well, people um, 
developed an anxiety about immigrants and radicals and a paranoia about communists, which led to um, immigration restrictions and only allowing so many immigrants to come into our country. Uh, and so, yeah. Now, we're going to now kind of, kind of bleh, sorry, we're now going to transition uh, to a little bit more of the positive side of the inner, um, inner war period. Um, you see, like, right after the war, we had all these problems, all these issues, but eventually it's going to go into this great, wonderful time, even though it's the 1920s. Um, and, I mean, you guys have read The Great Gatsby in English class, I believe, and you know, like, how like wealthy people were and things like that during this time. People, people were just spending money everywhere. And there's reasons why people were able to just be spending money everywhere. Um, so let's talk about, like, how people were, ha were having all this money. So it says, a new economic era, Ford revolutionizes the industry, leading into the prosperous era known as the Roaring Twenties. So... Henry Ford was trying to find a way to bring prices down on the Model T to make it more affordable for everyone. And so he really started to look at the manufacturing process and see how he could save money in the manufacturing process. Um, and he got this idea, you know, of the interchangeable parts and putting them on moving belts, um, like an assembly line um, from the meatpacking plants. And so he hires his man, Frederick Winslow Taylor, to determine how workers should move, like what's the most efficient way of doing this, like in the order, where should they be moving, like standing, and what speed should they be going at to be the most productive so they're not making mistakes. They're still developing a quality product as well. Here you can see uh, men working on the assembly line with interchangeable parts. And as I talked about, they developed the very first large-scale moving assembly line. Each worker had one of 84 specific jobs on the assembly line, and it wasn't like really high skills that they had to have. I mean, it was very minute skills, very simple skills. Um, and so, you know, people with less education could get a job there. And um, it was also known, too, that Ford paid his workers very well. Um, he was not one to cheat the workers out of money. He paid his workers uh, pretty well for working in his factory. And he ended up producing a car every hour and a half, and it was sold for around $500 during that time. By 1929, 22 million cars were being driven around in the United States. And this idea of the assembly line and mass producing spreads across to all other industries. And in the 1920s, productivity increases by 60%, um, which led to welfare capitalism, in which now um, companies are making enough money that they can provide benefits to their workers. So like insurance, uh, like sick days, things like that. Uh, they're able to provide those benefits for them because everything is just thriving, right? And so everything's thriving, meaning they have money to pay those people, and then those people can go out and buy stuff. Um, just putting more money back into the economy. So everyone's just wanting to spend money and businesses are doing awesome. And so everything is going really well during this time. And the question asks, will innovation help transform industry? And hopefully we know that is the assembly line. So along with this new sense of production, we also have the new consumer. Um, with the explosion of new products, new experiences, new forms of mass communication as well too. So the way we spend our money then now changes. So we have a variety of new electronic appliances that are created, like we have vacuums, we have radios, uh, laundry machines, things like refrigerators, things of that nature that we never had before or could afford. Um, and the radio, of course, too, we could stay connected to the world, like everyone was able to get this stuff. And then also airplane travel uh, started to open up in the late 1920s. Now it wasn't like, the air travel you know today. Um, it was not comfortable. The passengers still wore goggles and helmets and you could not fly over the mountains or fly at nighttime because it wasn't safe. So this was just the very beginning of air travel, but obviously a new um, avenue to make money. This is an example of one of the very first radios. And during this time, because you have all of these new products, advertisers became like cheerleaders and they started to gain a major role in the economy. People in advertising started to make bank. If you've ever seen Mad Men, that kind of shows the rise of the advertising industry during this era um, in which they were making loads of money. Now, um, prior to this, 
the way Americans bought things and what was acceptable is that everyone paid in full. So like you went and bought a refrigerator, you were paying full price for that refrigerator right then. Um, or if you went and bought furniture and things like that, you were paying it in full. Borrowing money was not very respectable, um, anything like that. So you didn't want to like have to borrow to pay or like, like you know, go on loans or anything like that and like pay back uh, slowly. It was not respectful. But what ends up happening is that people, like people have this money and whatnot, they actually turn to installment buying because they're like, oh, we'll have the money later. later. Installment buying is essentially like um, a credit card or um, if you ever bought like a really, really big purchase or like a car payment, like you're paying a little bit every single month. Um, and so installment buying is paying for an item over time in small payments. So like I bought my furniture and they had a form of installment buying. So why would I not pay for it a little bit over time? Even though if I have, like I have the money to pay for it, why not pay for it in little increments and not just like blow all that money right then? And so back then that's what they did too. They're like, oh, I'll have the money later. Like I'll just pay for a little bit at a time. Um, and so they're buying things on credit. And you think about your credit card and whoop, like swipe that credit card. Oh, I'll pay for it later. It's essentially kind of what was going on back then. They were buying things on credit. They're like, oh, I'll pay for it later or I'll pay for a little bit now and pay the rest off later. 90% of goods were bought on credit. And that's important to remember. Um, during the 1920s, everyone is just spending money and everyone is buying it on credit. So people are ending up having debt, uh, which they eventually will pay off. But if you know anything about history and what happens after the 20s, you know, that's going to send a lot of people into trouble. So the question asks, how did life change for the consumers in the 1920s? Um, you can talk about like they have more options to buy different things. They um, had more opportunities for jobs. Uh, they also had different ways to purchase things by using like installment buying and just the, the culture of um, buying things and shopping start really started to change. Just every, new things started to become acceptable. So um, that's all I have for today. Hopefully you guys don't have any questions, but if you do, you can always email me um, and let me know what questions you may have. So we'll see you later.